Out of the depths have I cried to thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. Those few words are the opening sentences to the prayer that we call De Profundis, the prayer from Psalm 129 in the Old Testament. And it is also a prayer for which we often offer for the benefit of the poor souls in purgatory. At Fatima, the Mother of God succinctly highlighted the Church's doctrines and dogmas, which are so frequently undermined, if not outright denied. Among these truths are the realities of heaven and purgatory, two topics which briefly arose when the child Lucia asked Our Lady about two neighbor girls who had recently died. Our Lady revealed that one was in heaven, but of the other, the Virgin said, she will be in purgatory until the end of the world. That latter disclosure from the Mother of God never fails to flabbergast many Catholics, and it usually results in what I call purgatory and the question of Amelia, for that was the girl's name. The most common question is, what could she have possibly done? Today, I'm going to offer additional thoughts in regard to this question. Dear listeners, hello and welcome. I'm Mariana Bartold, the guest host of Science and Secrets, featured by the Fatima Center's channel. I'm the author of Fatima, the Science and Secrets, Guadalupe, Secrets of the Image, and I am the host of my own growing channel, Genesis 315. Thanks to the generosity of the Fatima Center, you will find in the description box various links to my works and to my channel. Now today, I am again sharing with you excerpts from my book, Fatima, The Science and Secrets, which features over 1,000 footnotes, with quotes from various sources, including the Holy Scriptures, both the Old Testament and the New, St. Augustine of Hippo, the Council of Trent, and above all, quoting our Lord in the Holy Scriptures, I outline the proofs of the Church's doctrine on purgatory. This doctrine is one which pertains to both the interior life of the soul and the inseparable justice and mercy of God. Incidentally, the word purgatory comes from the Latin term purgare, which means to purify or to cleanse. But to return to the question of Amelia, what did she do? That is, what confessed and forgiven sin or sins committed by a young person, a teenager by today's standards, who lived in a remote village without any modern conveniences or amusements could lead to a purgatory of such duration. The only answer upon which we can assuredly rely comes from Sister Lucia, who had been the eldest of the child Fatima visionaries. When years basically almost 30 years after, 20 or 30 years, she was asked by Father Thomas McGlynn about certain details regarding Amelia. Sister Lucia's charitable, prudent, and brief response was befitting of the servant of God, who is now venerable, because she said, Amelia was 18 years old, Father, and after all, for one mortal sin, a soul may be in hell forever. Think of it, one mortal sin. Was Lucia's response a delicate hint that it was one mortal sin, obviously repented, confessed to, and absolved by a Catholic priest, for which Amelia would endure a purgatory incomprehensible to our minds? Did Our Lady make this known to Lucia? We really don't know, but if such was the case, it still remains that we do not know with absolute certainty the details of Amelia's confessed sin or sins, but neither do we need to know. Instead, we should consider the reasons why Our Lady allowed to be made public the state of two souls, one who was already in heaven, a revelation which didn't seem to impact many people, and one who would be in purgatory until the end of time. In fact, we can well reflect on these following words from the Fatima historian and apologist, Brother Michael of the Holy Trinity. What is certain is that Our Lady wanted us to know this for our instruction, and it would be foolish presumption to pretend to dispute the judgments of God. He alone, who intimately knows each soul, the abundance of graces He has given to it, the degree of knowledge it had of its fault, and the quality of its repentance, is the judge of the gravity of sin.
Brother Michael also wisely noted that we may rarely think about Maria de Nevis, the girl who we are told by Our Lady was already in heaven. No, we are not inclined to ponder much about Maria, for today we are misled and often told that heaven is our supernatural right. Perhaps we don't think often enough of the straight and narrow path to heaven, which is made known by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who said to us, pick up your cross daily and follow me. So, should we not want to contemplate the teenage Maria, if only for a few moments, and ask ourselves, how did she fulfill God's commandments? What heroic virtues did she practice? Did she endure purgatory at all, or was her soul taken straight to heaven? Were inquiries ever made about the details of her life or her death? Is there anything really known about this young lady other than her name and her age? Or did her humble and hidden interior life, in which, as it seems, no one showed interest, even when her glorious state in heaven was made known by the Mother of God, serve as a lesson in itself? Since it appears that there were no questions about Maria ever asked, we really don't have any details. What we do have, however, is Our Lady's word that Maria is in heaven, and that is enough to tell us two simple and beautiful things about her. She was a good girl and a good Christian. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. But we do not forget Amelia, who died in the state of grace and is saved, nor should we forget her. It is, after all, our sacred duty to pray for and make sacrifices on behalf of the poor souls in purgatory, whom we also call the poor but holy souls in purgatory. We call these souls poor because they can do nothing for themselves. They rely always on our charity offered on their behalf. And we call them holy because there is no question that they are among the saved. Cherished by God and assured of their salvation, they can and do intercede for us with their prayers. However, while the poor souls can pray for us, they can no longer gain merit for themselves. And since the saints in heaven pray for them but cannot acquire any indulgences for them, those who languish in purgatory rely on the charity of the living on earth, that is, on the charity of the church militant. This is the beautiful secret regarding purgatory, as St. John Chrysostom reminded us. Not by weeping, but in prayer and almsgiving are the dead relieved. It is only we who can obtain many indulgences, plenary and partial, for the faithful departed. We have three central means at our disposal to offer them relief and deliverance. First and above them, above all of them, is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And then there is the Holy Rosary, under which, under certain conditions, we can obtain a plenary indulgence, which is applicable to the poor souls in purgatory. And then there is almsgiving, of which the latter includes, but is not limited to, assisting others in need, fasting, and making all we do a sacrifice not only for the conversion of sinners, but also for the relief of the poor but holy souls in purgatory. And remember, since God's generosity can never be outdone, He not only allows all of our offerings to help the souls in purgatory, but He also grants that these same actions gain us merit, an increase in sanctifying grace, a higher degree of charity, closer union with God, and thus a higher degree of glory in heaven for all eternity. There is much more that our God has revealed about purgatory, but what is most important is to follow the charitable advice of the eternal church, and which is so beautifully summarized by St. Augustine. Forget not the dead, and hasten to pray for them. Finally, please allow me to share this reminder that you are invited to join me every other Wednesday for more episodes of Signs and Secrets here on the Fatima Center channel. Until the next time, may God bless you and may Our Lady Mary keep you and yours under her starry mantle. Salve Regina. Salve Regina.